Uh, right, so I'll start by telling you a story, actually. It's a, it's a story from some clinicians who are working in the project, slightly modified to, to not uh, infringe anyone's confidence. Uh, after that, we'll talk about this, the system concept here. It's, I would say, more than an endoscope. The aim is to sense and diagnose in addition to image. So that, that's the extra uh, novelty we bring here. At the heart of it, I would like to say, as, a, as I am a sensor designer, is, is, the, is the detector. Uh, and we aim to, to bring a new type of detection to uh, intensity imaging, that of time resolution, uh, both imaging and, and sensing. OK, so the story here is a 56-year-old male. He's uh, on holiday. He's been on the golf course. And he suddenly comes down with a, 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 sh a condition of being short of breath. He's taken into hospital and is, is rapidly deteriorating, requires oxygen. Um, and of course, the, the doctor set about uh, trying to understand what's the, what condition is affecting him. Uh, the first thing they do is, is obviously take an x-ray. And you can see here some sort of clouding of, of the lung area, but still there's not uh, a very clear indication of what's, uh, what's the matter with this patient. So the next step would be to, to now take a series of CT scans uh, through the body. And once again, it gives a little bit more of a clue. You can see uh, on the left-hand side uh, uh, um, a cavity uh, appearing in the, in the, in the lung area. Uh, well, that's still not enough to understand what's uh, clinically wrong with the, the patient. So the next step would be some biology, uh, where they, they, they do a, perform a lavage inside the lung, and then they would culture that or perform PCR, culturing to study um, uh, the pre uh, fungal conditions or bacterial conditions in the lung. Uh, PCR to multiply uh, DNA to, to study um, the presence of viral conditions. The problem with all this is uh, it takes two days already. It's a, not a, a, a short procedure. Um, and a lot of these, a lot of bacteria and, and fungal elements are already present in, in not dangerous quantities in the lung. So your, your challenge is to understand the one that's actually uh, called endangering the patient's uh, um, life. Um, uh, on the other hand, PCR is not a very specific um, 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 uh, approach. It will multiply all sorts of DNA and, and it's once again difficult to understand which viral condition might be, be present. So um, the upshot of this is that um, uh, the doctors tend to, if they haven't understood what's wrong with the patient at this stage, they tend to take what, what our clinician calls the Domestos approach. Domestos is a, a, a brand of, of bleach, and its slogan was it kills 99% of all known germs. Uh, and indeed, this is what they do to patients if they haven't understood from these uh, types of uh, um, diagnostic procedures. They'll apply a whole cocktail of strong drugs, antibacterial, antifungal, uh, anti-inflammatory, antiviral drugs, right? And that's the list here that was applied on day 21 of, of this, uh, um, or, or over, over a period of, of time uh, whilst looking at the patient. What you can see at the bottom here is the temperature of that patient. And you can see here, uh, not correlated with the uh, introduction of these drugs, is his temperature is still... Uh, very high, it's not responding to these, uh, the, the, this strong cocktail of drugs. So clearly, it, it's, it's not working, right? And indeed, uh, there has been a study of this type of approach, which I think it's got a formal term here, um, uh, but essentially applying a, a, a random set of, of all-encompassing uh, drugs. Um, and what they found is actually it's almost more harmful to do it, right? You're seeing 34% of patients are dying versus 20% of cases where nothing was done. But it, you, you'll be a very brave doctor to say to a patient, uh, you're, you're very ill, 
and we're not going to do anything. So a lot of the treatment is, in, is this scattergun approach. If the other uh, um, uh, procedures have not indicated uh, uh, what the problem was. Now, it's, it's worse than that, right? You've given this patient some very strong drug treatments, and it's actually damaging them. Uh, in this patient, here are, the, here are the number of things that were starting to happen due to these drugs, you know, uh, anemic condition, a hypoxic in the, in the lungs themselves, the liver was starting to fail, hepatitis, and he had declining renal, renal function, nothing to do with his original um, uh, condition. And I'm sorry to even have to present this slide, but I'm afraid the outcome was this patient after 30 days of these very strong drugs uh, passed away um, quietly with his son at his bedside. And you know, this is obviously a very emotive story, but it really begs the question, can we not do better? Can we not have some system that will uh, understand which of these conditions the patient has at his bedside within the intensive care unit. It has a, a slight follow-on. The, 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 the family did allow an autopsy and it was later determined to be a fungal condition that wasn't picked up in the, in the uh, other um, biology uh, studies that were, were applied. So really what we need to know, what, what's happening in that lung? Look down in it, what pathogens are present? Uh, what's the inflammatory system doing? And if we had known that, if the doctors had known that, they would have targeted one of these drugs towards the patient, not the whole cocktail, and essentially damaged his, uh, his function. So really that's our aim in this project, It's make a, a system that uh, understands the temporal molecular processes that occur in the human lung in vivo, in situ. So look down in the lung and try and pick up uh, these, these conditions rather than having to do this in a laboratory a few days later. And um, indeed this is a project, UK project, a fairly unusual UK project. It was a call a few years ago for what are called interdisciplinary research collaborations in sensing systems for healthcare. Um, and you can see the list of things that were required, but the upshot of, of that is that they were really asking uh, four different universities in this case with strong individual skills, quite a number of different disciplines to come together with the aim of making a medical instrument, right? Now that's very unusual for universities to have an end objective that is a realizable uh, instrument that would be qualified in the clinic. And, that, and I, I stress that, right? So that is our challenge at the end of this project. Uh, and as such, you can see it's uh, got a very nice core of the project, which is also, I would say, unusual in a university project. We have a hub which draws together all people from all of these disciplines in their different departments in the universities and, and places them in a hub which is actually centred within uh, the medical school or, and, and the hospital in Edinburgh. So we have a big room, we have a set of laboratories for performing and, and testing this instrument and we're right next door to the, 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 the medical doctors using this system. So um, quickly, here's the system concept that we're engaged in. It centres around in, in, in an opposite sense to, to what I heard Martin doing, we, we're actually doing a, a detector at the proximal end of an endoscope, not a camera at the far end. And the reason for that is we require some fairly specialised detectors. It centres around a very specialised uh, imaging bundle. So it's a mixture of an, a, a multi-core fibre bundle for regular imaging, as, as is found in, in the previous generation endoscopes. Um, but fairly uniquely, uh, a package of other fibres, optic fibres that are manufactured specially within the project that contain sensing probes, specifically designed chemical probes that will alter their fluorescence or Raman signature in response to uh, a, 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 a dose, a tiny, tiny dose of a targeted uh, chemical agent that's designed in the chemistry um, 
part of the project. And that's why there's also a hollow optic fiber able to deliver and actually extract fluid from, from the lung. So it's all a tiny bundle. The whole set of these fibers is only a, a 1.4 millimeters together. Um, at the other end of the fiber, we have a, an optical system, uh, which is um, uh, scanning and, and picking up the fluorescent signals or Raman signals from the, the end of the fiber or indeed in the lung through confocal scanning of the fiber. That's then fed into uh, some detectors which are then uh, computed, where images are computed live and real time. And ultimately, we have all the skills in the project to go from an optic fiber, the chemistry, uh, custom fibers are being manufactured in the project. We have teams of engineers and optical physicists. We have people doing um, the uh, computing and image processing. So it's a, it's a really uh, all the way from clinical investigation in patients to uh, to engineering and, and science. So, and this, this slide here tries to depict all the disciplines that are actually engaged in the production of this medical instrument. You see here uh, a team drawing a very custom optic fiber. There's a cross section of one, a special hollow optic fiber. We can inscribe and pattern those fibers in the project. We design special chemistry of fluorescent dye molecules. Uh, there's an, uh, a CMOS sensor that's, uh, that's in, uh, responsible for in, in my team. Uh, we, we perform uh, experiments in lungs. This is a sheep lung being, being trialed, all the way to the instrument being used at the bedside of a patient in the IC in intensive care unit. So that's the collection of technologies that we're trying to put together. I'll just go through now some of the components of that. Here's a, an optic fiber, There's some of the parts of the optic fiber uh, shown for real here. Um, a hollow fiber that's delivering smart uh, molecules, smart probes we call them. Um, a fiber bundle for imaging that's also developed in, in, in the project. And an, an area with small pits in which we place beads that pick up um, sensing uh, of things like pH, redox, or oxygenation. And there's some, some rather nice images from the bath team of the types of fibers that they have manufactured for us in the project. Uh, hollow fibers for, for fluid delivery, fibers with pits for um, bead uh, uh, location, and imaging fibers here. We have already, we've, we moved very quickly in this project to make a first version of the uh, sensing system, uh, which was aimed already at a few different colors. So aimed at, up, at picking up fluorescent signals from the smart probe molecules. So you see here three channels, green, red, and near infrared. You see an image of the lung. This is a wide field camera placed at the proximal end of the, of the system. You see it boxed up here and you see a clinician actually using the system. Now that really already goes beyond the current, uh, uh, currently available technology and it's picking up three different fluorescent dye markers simultaneously, whereas current systems will, will generally only uh, um, see one of those. Uh, I'm not gonna go into too much of the optical system. Obviously it's a series of, in this case, LEDs, a camera, a CMOS camera, uh, some dedicated software, and it fits into a unit here. But really the topic that I'm, I'm engaged in here is trying to progress that even further, look at molecular uh, um, properties of the chemistry that's being designed in, in, the, in the project through specialized detectors that are time resolved, so that are picking up uh, the time resolved properties of fluorescence, such as the fluorescence lifetime or the time resolved Raman signature from, from specific molecules designed to interact with disease states. Why are we doing that? Because fluorescence lifetime offers specificity, offers contrast over the autofluorescence that's present in the lung in any case. Raman also interacts with specialized SERS type sensors, which have a much higher signal than conventional uh, sensors. 
And from us as sensor designers, it all translates into designing a very fast scanning, uh, high fill factor SPAD detector array. I mean, you heard a lot about SPADs yesterday. Uh, I'm, not, I'm probably going to pass quickly over it. SPAS you heard about yesterday, it revolves around, in the first phase of the project, two existing sensors. This sensor was developed in a European project. It's a SPAD camera with a relatively low fill factor, but good enough to prototype the first uh, images uh, from our project. Um, what's unique about it is a SPAD. Uh, with timing circuitry that's able to time photons up to a 50 picosecond time re resolution over a 50 nanosecond dynamic range, as well as count photons for, for um, intensity imaging. It is a very fast detector, so we can use it in a scanning system relatively, um, uh, relatively well. The second detector, once again, existed before the project and being used in the first trials in, in in the second instrument we're building is a spectrometer. We want to look at uh, multiple fluorescent dye signatures, and the best way to separate them is spectrally. So here's a spectrometer. It's a SPAD array, essentially, with timers, again, uh, that can be scanned very, very quickly, with SPADs that will pick up either the blue fluorescent range or near-infrared range, which is more suited for Raman detection. So my aim is not to go very deeply into the detectors. That's a, certainly a demanding part of the project. We're moving on to a new generation of these detectors. I really want to show you why you do, what, what else do we get from these detectors. So we put them in, uh, in this case, the, uh, uh, an imaging system. You see the SPAD camera here, a benchtop imaging system that lets us do um, confocal scanning of the fiber bundle. Uh, with here's the optical system, um, some Galvo scanners, some optics uh, at the end of the fiber, um, our specialized um, fiber from Blath, uh, and indeed our time-resolved camera. First image from that system is actually without our detector, just to check the thing is working. Here's an APD being used, and here's a typical image from uh, a non-time resolved image from, the, uh, from within the lung showing uh, lung tissue and fluorescein labelled cells and bacteria. And indeed, you see not much contrast. There's a lot of signals that could be uh, present from the lung tissue itself. When we add some fluorescence lifetime, and that's indicated by the colour scale here, superimposed on the uh, the, the intensity image, you can see a real clear contrast of a change of lifetime in a certain part of the, of the image. In fact, if you could look closer in the, in the image, the, the screen resolution, not particularly good, but you can see individual bacteria which have been labelled with fluorescent dye molecules showing some red contrast with the background. Um, the team that were Embedding that detector went a little bit further. They said, well, why can't we do two fluorescent dyes with fluorescence lifetime with the same camera? And they did that by using two pulsed lasers at two different wavelengths, exciting two different types of dye molecules. Um, and they time offset those two so they could separate one fluorescence lifetime from the other by choosing certain ranges of time from the detector area. And here's a test image of that. It's, it's not in the lung this time. It's two different types of beads with fluorescence lifetime showing up as a, 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 a shift of the, the colors encoding the fluorescence lifetime of these beads. Now, what I, I want to stress is this is a preliminary system. The camera we've got here is a 1% fill factor, right? So it's really just being used to show the effectiveness of fluorescence lifetime in providing that contrast. The upshot of the low fill factor is relatively low scan rate, so we're only at one frame per second here. Um, but uh, next generation cameras will, will easily increase that by orders of magnitude, so an, an order of magnitude. So that, that's our aim uh, in, in the, the final part of the project. 
Um, so unfortunately, it doesn't show very well on this screen, but here are the two color channels. With fluorescent labeled bacteria, we can tell the difference between gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria by the shift of the fluorescence lifetime by specifically designed uh, fluorescent probe molecules that come from uh, the chemistry team in Edinburgh. And uh, the enhancement of or contrast in the image is then color coded as a fluorescence lifetime shift on the, on the background. Here's the image without fluorescence lifetime. You can clearly see areas uh, of, of, of bacteria in, in that uh, lung image. Right, but it's not just imaging, it's sensing as well, right? So here's the next part that I, I want to talk about. So what we do here is we have another part of the fiber. It's another part of, not the imaging part of the fiber. It's really a, a fiber uh, with a series of pits, in this case about, I think, 10 microns. Here's a zoomed image of that. 10 micron pits in which we, which we place 10 micron sized beads. Those beads have had fluorescent dye sensors or SERS reporters uh, uh, embedded within them. And they sit and locate very, very well in these pits and give a very strong uh, fluorescent or Raman signature. So they auto-locate almost when you, you put the beads in location at the end of the fiber. Uh, we, if you, you can see that if you get the beads the same size as the fiber, you only get one in each pit. If you, if you don't match the size, you get a couple. And then the, the different types of uh, signature they give could be mixed together. So there's quite a nice property uh, that each big bead can be designed with a different optical signature. So once again, here's, a, here's the image from such a part of the fiber. Uh, on the top in intensity mode, on the bottom with lifetime mode, and you can see in two color channels the lifetime showing uh, some contrast and specific lifetime relating to the type of bead. In fact, the line sensor lets us do that with an arbitrary spectral and fluorescence lifetime signature. So on this axis, we have wavelength. On this axis, we have uh, fluorescence lifetime or the decay constant. So the lung tissue is generally like that. A fluorescent dye molecule will clearly be distinguished from the lung tissue by longer uh, lifetimes. You can also see it in the fluorescence decay curves from a fluorescent probe, MBD. The, the, the chemists have some terrible names for their probes. Um, from skin, from cancerous tissue, and from normal lung tissue. And one of the advantages of the fluorescent uh, detec uh, detection of lifetime is that it, it can be resistant to, to photo bleaching. Now, it's, we don't just use fluorescence lifetime in the sensing part of the system. We're also trying to, to, to look at whether we can use uh, SERS or Raman uh, um, um, probe molecules. So this, once again, uh, another type of uh, probe detect, designed in the chemistry department, which as a function of pH, pH here 4 to 10 range, uh, you can see the Raman spectra here. And you can see these two peaks here emerging. Uh, actually, those, those two peaks track quite nicely uh, the required pH range for physio physiologically significant uh, studies. So that's, that's uh, quite a, a, um, an interesting uh, way of sensing the background environment of lung. We're not sensing it anymore the specific bacteria type that's present. We're, we're sensing uh, the environmental properties within the lung. Once again, the same idea, we're trying to now, now locate very, very small beads. The, the beads tend to be smaller for the Raman probes in these pits. Uh, in this case, for pH, redox, and glucose. Um, one of the problems we have when doing this over a fiber, if we want to sense Raman, is there's a back, Raman background from the fiber itself, which can mask some of the peaks we want to uh, study. So there are a couple of approaches in the project to try to uh, eliminate that, that background or attenuate it, um, and I'll, I'll show you those later. Uh, just some results from the type of SERS uh, molecules, uh, MBA for short, you can see the chemical signature. It's really these two peaks at uh, these wave numbers that emerge and show a very nice proportionality 
over the pH of range 6 to 8, uh, um, which where the, 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 the ratio of a peak to a, a non-changing peak is plotted here. So there's a nice linear sensing of, of pH here. Uh, okay, the Raman background signature, here's where time resolve measurements can play a role, is we can actually time gate or time remove the Raman background signature by simply monitoring signals that are returned from us from the point in time that this signal, a pulsed light source, returns to us from the end of the fiber. And we just simply throw away any time-related signatures which have returned from us from any duration of the signal pass or the light passing down the fiber on its way to the tip. There's another few approaches which are being investigated, which are just hollow fibers, that, where you deliver the light through a hollow fiber or you, and you return it through a, a sensing fiber. Um, and those are all being investigated within the project. I'm particularly interested in the time-resolved approach because that emphasizes the value of the, of the SPAD detectors. And here's a kind of interesting three-dimensional plot, right? Wavelength of the Raman uh, signal on this axis, time on this axis. Now, in this axis, the signal is traveling down the fiber, hits the end, and here you get the Raman signal at the, at the peak, and of course, that's its spectra. So you simply uh, abandon all the data that comes from here and from this section of the plot, and then you can zoom in precisely on the Raman signature that comes from the tip of the optic fiber and really absolutely need time-resolved spectral uh, detector to, to perform this type of uh, analysis. Raman, this has been presented by quite a few other groups. I mean, it, it's a very interesting property. The other advantage of doing Raman with the SPAD detector is we can also throw away or, or reject some of the fluorescence just by using the temporal properties of, of Raman, which is, is uh, emitted almost coincident with the laser impulse. So, um, but here we've got two things. We're rejecting the background of the fiber and we're zooming in on the spectral signature from the Raman. Okay, I, 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 I'm going to wrap up. It's uh, a system which uh, even the first prototype is already having trials in man and, and we're uh, we're tasked with that in this research project of taking the unit and performing uh, clinical qualification of the instrument in, in man. Um, we are engaged in a more advanced system involving the time resolved detectors and custom designed chemical probes actually designed for contrasting fluorescence lifetime. And I believe that the time resolved SPAD detectors, when we improve their um, optical efficiency, their fill factor, and their line rate will be a very valuable part of, of this, uh, this new system. Uh, I think lots of people to, to thank here. It's a big team here, all the PIs. And, uh, but the best slide is the people who are actually doing all the work. Uh, and you can, see, you can see they're having, they're, it's not all work, they're having some fun as well. So these are the real guys. Thank you. Thank you very much.